Welcome to MX Graph Made Simple Part 6. Today we're going to learn about a new layout, Fast Organic Layout. Now I know that sounds like it should be a combination of McDonald's and Whole Foods, but it's none of the above. Uh, fast Organic Layout, we're going to see what it looks like in a moment. Uh, first I'm going to give you what this would look like using the old layout that we learned about, which is of course the hierarchical layout. I actually generated this meaningless data using a Python script uh, that made an XML file and our hierarchy here is three levels deep. We've got a president, we have a random number of vice presidents, in this case the computer chose four, and each one of those have a random number of team members who work under them. Now what we're going to do is change that hierarchical graph to a fast organic layout. Let's save it and refresh the screen and there you go. Now obviously in many aspects this would be a much better layout to be able to see everything clearly. It has some disadvantages obviously which is that it's difficult to see the hierarchy uh, but if that's not necessarily important um, this graph has certainly many advantages. Here you get to see all the team members very clearly all in one place. Now it's not always that way. Obviously if you have thousands of vertices, uh, you certainly won't see them all on one screen like this. Now let's take a deeper dive into the fast organic graph and we're going to see some of the variables and uh, I have to say that as I was trying to learn more about uh, this graph and understanding how it works, um, I'm still stuck missing some very important points. Um, but I did get to see something that I thought was actually quite beautiful. And these are graphs that are based on similar technology. And here you have a graph that you can imagine has thousands of vertices and corresponding edges. And I would imagine that as you get into larger and larger graphs, they actually take on very beautiful shapes. And here's one more example. These two pictures are actually the same data uh, using slightly different types of graphs. Let's get back to our script. And take a look at some of the variables that are available to us. The first variable, layout.useInputOrigin, to be quite honest, I didn't completely understand. But as the documentation tells us, it specifies if the top left corner of the input cells should be the origin of the layout. I tried playing around with it and I didn't see any difference. Layout.reset edges, we've seen in other places. Uh, the default is true, um, and it specifies, as the documentation says, if all edge points of traversed edges should be removed. Again, um, using the graph and the example that I'm using, I didn't see any difference uh, whether this is true or false, but I'm sure that in more complicated graph scenarios, uh, this would make a difference. Layout that disable edge style. Again, as we mentioned earlier, we are able to make many different edge styles, uh, and by default, this is set to true, which will say that whichever edge style that you've declared uh, is going to be null and void, uh, hence disabled. If, on the other hand, you want those edge styles to be uh, noticeable, uh, you're going to have to set this to false. Now here is where we begin to see some of the specific variables that can be used 
for this particular layout. Uh, the first one is constant. If you can conceptualize each of the vertices as being an object connected to springs, and those springs are connected to other vertices. And as we know, springs can be pulled, and then they have an energy pulling them back to their source. And if you push them too close together, they have an energy that forces them outward. And basically, the way these graphs work is that the computer goes through the particular algorithm numerous times until it comes to the most comfortable, if you want to call it that, um, position where there is the least amount of pulling and pushing on these springs. This force constant is the number that's being used to uh, divide or multiply against these forces, whether it's uh, the attractive force or the repulsion. So 50 is the default. Let's just take a look at what the graph looks like set at the default. By the way, you'll notice that these graphs are not exact, hence they're called organic. Each time we refresh the page, it's actually going to look a little different, even if we make no changes to the variables. But anyhow, this is basically what it looks like with the force constant being set at 50. Now let's see what would happen if we change the force constant to 500. So we see the repulsion is much greater, pushing things further and further apart from each other. Let's see what it looks like if we had it set to 5. Everything is grouped very closely together. And now we'll set it back to the default of 50. The next variable, layout.forceConstant squared, is actually a variable that's not meant necessarily to be set, but it's a variable that's meant to be checked or to be used. Perhaps the best way to inspect this variable would be to set up a console.log and to see the force constant squared in that console.log. What we're going to do is set up a console.log with all of these variables that are similar, which we're going to see there's about 10 of them towards the end. Uh, we're going to set them all up at once so that we don't have to keep going back and forth, and you will see what each one of them does. Now we're going to move on to the initial temp variable. I guess the best way to describe temperature, as I understand it at least, is the, um, let's say, the kinetic energy, the friction that exists um, when you're pulling and pushing at all of these various springs. And the idea is to bring this temperature down uh, as much as possible, and that creates the highest level of organization. So, um, once the temperature is down to 1, that means that everything is pretty much settled. Now, these two next variables, initial temp and max iterations, are going to have an effect on this. The initial temp is the level uh, that you begin at, um, and that would mean uh, how much tension, let's say, you're putting into these springs um, in order that when they bounce back uh, to their stasis state when they bounce back to a state of the least amount of temperature uh, that they would be that much more organized let's say um, and then the max iterations is how many times to go through the algorithm in order to reach that lower temperature
That means to say if you start, for example, at a layout initial temp of 200, but only have perhaps 100 iterations, uh, it will be less organized than if you have the full 200 iterations. As a matter of fact, the final temperature, which is seen in right here at layout.temperature, which we could uh, find in a console.log, um, would wind up not going all the way down to one necessarily. It could be to five, for example, and that would mean that it's still not as organized as it can be. So uh, let's try these out. We're going to start with the defaults, which is the initial temp is 200. And I think the default for max iteration was 200, but I don't remember. And that's pretty much uh, how we began, because these are, after all, the defaults. OK, so let's try playing with these uh, variables. Let's start by setting the initial temp uh, from 200. And we're going to bring it all the way up to 2000. Well, 2002, why not? Let's save it. And we don't see that much difference, uh, again, because this is a rather simple graph. Um, but if we looked in the console, we would actually see the uh, where the temperature reached by the time it went through all of its 200 iterations. Let's actually do that. Let's look at the console. Our current temperature is at 10. 10 actually, if you'll notice, is the multiplier that gets us from 200 iterations to a 2000 temperature. If we took our initial temperature at 20, let's erase this, let's clear it out. And now our temperature is at 0.1. Again, 0.1 basically being the multiplier that gets us from 20 to 200. So if we did our max iterations at 20, let's clear this out, uh, you'll see that we're not very organized here. We could be significantly more organized but our temperature is all the way back down to 1. So the temperature doesn't necessarily mean the organizational level um, but the combination of the temperature and the amount of iterations we went through uh, in order to get to that temperature is going to be our level of organization. I imagine that the other thing to keep in mind is that if you go with a much higher temperature and many more iterations, you're obviously going to lose speed. Uh, once again, on a small uh, graph like ours, it probably doesn't make that much difference. But I would imagine that in a much larger graph with thousands or 50 or 100,000 vertices, um, your amount of iterations are going to make a big difference in terms of performance. Uh, but obviously that's the trade-off that you're going to have to use in order to also get the highest level of organization. Now that we have our web console open, I'm going to show you some of the variables that uh, seem to be primarily for inspection purposes. Of course we have our current temp. Uh, we have the min distance limit squared, which our min distance was set at 2, so obviously the squared is going to be 4. The force constant squared, ours was, our force constant was set at 50, uh, 
so the squared is going to be 2500. I'm not entirely sure why you would need that information, but I imagine that um, it can be used. Um, the current iteration, we went through 20 iterations because we asked it to go to through 20 iterations. Uh, if we had asked it to go through 100, then the current iteration obviously would be 100. Um, at any point along the way, you can uh, also say which is the current iteration. The Since we've gone through all the iterations, uh, we're up to the number of iterations, the min number of iterations that we've asked for. The first vertex is actually from the vertex array. Uh, and this is an array of all the vertices to be laid out. Uh, I chose to simplify it. And in our console.log, I only asked for vertex array 0, which means the first vertex, uh, just to show you what it looks like. But in truth, the vertex array includes all of the vertices. Uh, and obviously, on a very complex graph, that's uh, very large. And therefore, our console log would be uh, much too long for us to be reading. The next is displacement x. Uh, we started off everything at 0. Displacement y, we started everything off at 0, um, which is certainly allowable and uh, very convenient when it comes to any graph that has this type of layout. The radius, uh, it goes simply the radius for each one of the vertices. Radius squared. Obviously, you've got um, the first vertice was 70, which means the radius squared is going to be 4,900, and the second 60, which will be 3,600, etc., etc. The is movable is whether each one of these vertices are able to be moved. So you'll notice here we have them all true. That means that we're able to do this. And the neighbors is simply the sets of neighbors, uh, which things are contiguous one to the next. So vertice number one is a neighbor to vertice number four is a neighbor to vertice number seven. And um, if you uh, show this differently you can actually these will actually be set up in sets the indices um, I'm not exactly sure what that does and the allowed to run is whether we allow this layout to run or not um, it's a boolean which is true or false uh, and I'm not exactly sure where and, and how this would be used that's pretty much it I'm just going to show you real quickly in the code, um, layout that iteration, layout dot vertex array, layout dot disp x, etc, etc. And we simply displayed those by uh, a console log. And uh, I gave each one a little bit of a prefix in order to be able to read it uh, easier. That pretty much wraps it up for our fast organic layout lessons.